Welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 186, featuring the first part of an interview with the indomitable Mr. Tom Hall, co-founder of id Software, designer of Anachronox, and much, much more. Tom has launched a Kickstarter project called Worlds of Wonder, which is a platform game creator tool that comes with a complete platform game by the man himself. It looks completely awesome, but for some strange, uh, who knows what reason, this Kickstarter is not done very well at all. Fortunately, it has a few days left to go, so if you like this video and you like Tom, want to show your support for his work, go immediately. Now, you stress immediately to the Kickstarter page. I'll post a link here in the show notes. And uh, make a pledge of any size. I think Tom would appreciate it. If it is too late and the project is uh, unsuccessful, uh, still leave a comment. I'll let Tom uh, know you, you care about him and his games and want to see him uh, complete this project. I think he would really appreciate that, and so would I. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Tom Hall. All right, folks, I am here with the legendary Tom Hall. He's the founder and design, founding designer, founder and designer of uh, Pieces of Fun. He's also he's got a lot of uh, wonderful games to his name, including the uh, Commander Keen series, Anachronox, Rise of the Triad, Wolfenstein 3D, and a game called Doom that you've probably heard of. How are you doing, Tom? I am doing great. Now let's talk first about this uh, Kickstarter that you got going. It's called Worlds of Wonder, a platform game creator. About uh, 12 days left to go and a goal of $400,000. Notice yep. you described this as a super easy uh, platform game creator, online community, spiritual successor to Commander Keen. Uh, all of this sounds great. Uh, how's the project going? Uh, well, it's going okay. We just got uh, tweeted and messaged by Will Wheaton, so we'll see if there's a Wheaton bump, or you know, as they say. Uh, and uh, it's it's going fine. I mean, I I wish it was going a lot more, uh, but we'll just see how it does. There's always a peak at the end, and so on. Uh, even if the Kickstarter doesn't go, we're going to keep doing this in our spare time because we really believe in making tools accessible on every single platform uh, so you can continue, you know, like on your iPad if you're on a trip or something like that. And uh, just really putting super easy tools in the hands of people so they can create games as easy as they can create music or digital photos. And when you talk about super easy, uh, is it super easy for someone who has experience making games or uh, for adults or for kids? I mean, what's the target here? Well, the, uh, I think it, it will cross all ages, but I think it will enable kids to realize that they can make games too. Uh, back when I started, it was a very, very painful process. But the also the games were a bit simpler back then. So the the little text adventures, say I was making, were kind of as good as the ones that were being released. So I was like, hey, I could maybe do this. So now that games are so complex, uh, you need sort of complex tools to simplify the process, so that people can go, hey, I could do this all over again. Uh, so I mean, for instance, on the iPad you can just draw a shape with your finger and it fills it in and makes it something you can jump on. And whereas that used to be a painful process of data entry and stuff like that, now it's just like as if magic. And that that's the kind of ease of use that I want. So that if, if you just get in there with an already done game, so you're not worried about if it's actually going to work or not, and just add something to it, like add a little slope. And it's like, oh, well, I could do that. It's like, well, maybe I'll change the way this little platform moves. Okay, I could do that. Well, and just through that gradual process, you realize that you're really enabled with this tool uh, and in ways that really haven't been done before. Yeah, I was watching the, the Kickstarter video for this, and I don't know who can watch this video and not have an insatiable need to, to play around with this, this editing tool. I mean, it looks it looks fantastic. Very polished and slick. Yeah, well, that's I mean, that's part of uh, sort of what the iPhone and iPad taught interface designers is that you can make something that's as much of a joy to just enter data as it is to play. So that's that's what I wanted to bring to uh, game creators is that focus on a tool that's just for one type of game because I think a lot of game creation tools 
try to do everything everywhere and uh you know that's driven people mad before so this is just for platform games and with uh this works out really well then we're gonna go on to the other genres uh but if you can make something that's so fun to use that you have a joy in creating things that other people can play, that's going to bring out the best in what you do. That's going to make you work harder. Like, oh, I can do this so easily. I'm not inhibited by, you know, having to enter, you know, 5,000 little things with commas in between them. I can just draw and I can just stretch and I can just instantly play it. And, and that, ease of use and and small time to success is really encouraging and, and could lead to a, a sort of an explosion of creativity from people who haven't been enabled before. Now, if people make games uh, with, with uh, Worlds of Wonder, can they turn around and sell their games? Well, we're going to just get the platform going, the community going, and we'd like for it to be where uh, content would bubble up like people rate it and so on, and then the best stuff gets sort of incorporated and people can then, you know, make uh, uh, dough from it right now. We're checking with our, our technology partners to see if they can just sort of bundle Worlds Wonder and and go with that. But uh, if that's possible, I mean, I want to enable people to make games, and that's that's the point of this whole thing. So one way or, ten, or the other, yes, they will be able to do that. <laughs> now, one of the differences... Uh, between this product and packages like Game Maker? Um, well, I mean, I, I think everyone, all the game creation tools out there are brilliant, and they've all done something really well in most of them in, in some sense. Like Little Big Planet is really empowering and cool, but it's on the PS3, and it's a little daunting when you first get into the tool. There's just a bunch of icons and and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do right away. And then there isn't this sort of like leading in you into it uh, type of thing. And then game maker stencil, uh, lots, lots of really great tools out there. And a lot of them do things across uh, different uh, platforms, but I don't think any of them really has, has made me feel like I'm just, flowing in creation of stuff there's always a sort of learning curve and a lot of people will see game creation tools and they'll just see like it looks like photoshop or something like that it's just like just seeing that turns their brain off it's just like this is instantly an app that i have to learn and that's a bunch of work whereas it should just look like a game that you're kind of twiddling with when you start and then, and then when you get used to the whole thing, then you can open up sort of an advanced mode and, and really dig into the, the larger con ability to control every single facet of the game. All right, Tom, I've got two questions about this. Uh, one is, coming from someone that has such a, a noted career making platform games, I want to get your insights into how do you design a really good one? And then I'm also just curious about why you think this genre has, has lasted so long and, and people are still excited about platform games. Well, um, I mean, it, it's sort of exploded from, you know, the original, like, say, Donkey Kong, you know, that kind of thing, uh, that it was very a very understandable way to play a game. You just see a person, you can move them, left and right or her left and right and jump and, and do simple actions. So that that's a very understandable I am that person on the screen, I'm Mario, you know, and I can I can do these things and that are understandable and and have a very clear goal because it was just on one screen. And since then, you know, it's it's gone crazy all over the place with different kinds of things. And uh but there's there's so many ways to either convey a fun experience or tell a story. Uh, like one of my favorites of recent uh, years has been Limbo. It's just so, so atmospheric and beautiful and such into puzzles. They're just like, huh, I met this thing. Oh, maybe I should try this. Oh, it works. You know, it felt really good and it was and and. and Really, if you're afraid of spiders, don't play that game. First off, but uh, 
but there's there's a lot of different ways to express and to try new things and and I think if you get the controls just right so that you feel like if if something happens if you die you did it not the game that's the first challenge and the second is uh traveling through a world that that unravels and and uh has reward for exploration and mystery and uh is in building sort of abilities into your character that you introduce over time that uh you're constantly sort of adding one, making it a little easier after a difficult section, and then all is coming together so that you're you're uh, a new, complete master of this new type of combination of abilities by the time you get to the end of the game that the end boss or the end uh, scenario is an expression of everything you've learned how to do. Because a lot of people, you know, just say, uh, games are just learning. It's just an interesting way to teach, and then you learn how to do it, and you're rewarded for for what you've learned. And it's just an expression of you know learning and skill. So, culminating in in a use of all the things that you've learned how to do, and really you know doing those well is uh, is a, a joy at the end of a game like. My my wife finished her first game. She's played a lot of games that you can't finish, and she finished Plants vs. Zombies. So she was <laughs> like, oh, wow, and she got the little cinematic, you know, and it's like, oh. And, but she got that joy of, like, I have to use every single thing I've learned to defeat this boss, and and she did it very well. And so, well, that was pretty easy. It's just like, you just played that brilliantly. She doesn't realize how good a game player she is, but she just, like, you know, just like bang, 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 and just she's she's brilliant at it. Let me think of how to phrase this. Uh, so, someone that wanted to learn how to make really brilliant uh, platform games, uh, can you recommend, say, uh, three to four different games that they should really play carefully and, and study? Well, I mean, you uh, you of course have to study Mario because the variety of gameplay and. They kept uh, the story exactly the same, pretty much, for every single one. So you're not, uh, you know what you're getting as far as that. But they had to innovate in uh, in terms of gameplay and game style and stuff like that. You you could play a little bit of Super Mario Sunshine and kind of move on after that because I think that that's the single Mario that gets too hard, like it's not. A f- it's not this addition of brilliance that 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 you can easily flow through. It, it just actually gets so physically hard to do the controller that you kind of uh, it actually kind of crushed the dreams of a, a, a aunt and mother of a friend of mine who couldn't finish that one. But uh, that's brilliant. Limbo's brilliant. Uh, going back to the PlayStation Ape Escape uh, is a good game to look at for you looking at your controller and seeing exactly what could you make a natural control system for so they looked at the dual shot controller and saw the two joysticks and they go like wow you could do like a perfect rowboat with this so you go and jump in a rowboat and it's like you're paddling and this is just i haven't felt that kind of perfect control for something since you know the arcade days when they had you know tempest or a special controller that really enabled you to to feel like you're actually doing what you're what you're simulating so that that's a really good one to look at i mean there's been so many brilliant uh platformers that some are some are way hard and stuff like that i i mean a favorite one that's way hard uh that a lot of people know is super meat boy I played that at Indie Games Festival in Austin at uh, Fantastic Arcade or something like that, and it just like it was like it's so hard, but you know you're the one messing up. That if you just did it perfectly, you'd get through. And so that's that's the perfect sweet spot to hit for sort of harder games. Is like I can do this. I know I can do this. And uh, other other great title is uh, Braid. 
Uh, so you can do time travel and uh, sort of backwards and forwards in time to, to solve puzzles and so on. Uh, I really like Snapshot, which uh, just came out a little while ago, which was you're just this robot and you have the ability to take pictures of stuff, but when you take pictures of stuff, it removes it from the level and then you can place it somewhere that you need it. Uh, and even when you take the the picture, you're preserving the velocity of that object too. So if you're if like a rock's thundering down from the sky, you, you grab it and then point it, turn the picture and point it, and you can shoot that boulder at something else. So that's it's a, a lot of really novel things like that. Also, a, a company called Nitrome comes up with a lot of interesting mechanics, which are just sort of uh, just like here's this uh, little game, but it has this amazing mechanic where you can like smush parts of the level together. It's like wow, you know, I'm, someone's gonna take hold of that and make a big game out of that. And uh, and you know, I had Ton Pun and Portal, which is essentially you know 3D platform game based off of Narbacular Drop. But uh, I, I could go on and on. I don't. <laughs> well, if somebody wanted to use uh, use uh, Worlds of Wonder to recreate Dangerous Dave, uh, would that be copyright infringement? Uh, you're, well, yeah, I, I, it started with Dangerous Dave and copyright infringement. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. But I mean, if they're not if they're not making money. I mean, I'm I'm a fan of fan games. That's sort of almost the reason why Worlds of Wonder came about was I saw so many like fans of Keen making like little mods and fan games and it was like wow, you're like really doing a lot of hard work just to, you know, change the graphics in the old Keens and there's a lot of like data compression we did which made it kind of difficult to do what they're doing. So it was, that was like really heartening. You know, and heartwarming, and so that sort of combined with uh, playing games like Bastion. I played Bastion on. I, I just for trying it out, I, I got it in uh, Google. So I tried the browser, and I played it at work, and I come home, and then I played it, and I started right where I was in the browser. You know, uh, at home, and it's like, wow, that should be done for every product ever. Because that was such a joy, just like pick up your game and just da da do, you know. So, sort of all that confluence of stuff, wanting to do a platform game and seeing the mod community, you know, doing such awesome work, and then uh, seeing how how much of a joy I had playing when I could just continue on whatever computer I was on is sort of all smushing together into something I want to make. Now it's not just an editor, right? We also get uh, a complete game with this. Yeah, uh, I thought, you know, I, I could just, you know, do a spiritual successor to Commander Keen, but, you know, I could make a tool where and prove that the tool is powerful by making the game in the tool. And, and so uh, I want to make Secret Spaceship Club, which is, you know, sort of in the same vein as uh, Keen's universe, but, you know, all new stuff. But it's it has that kind of fun style and quirky sci-fi and uh sort of humor influenced half by warner brothers and half by hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy kind of thing so uh and just just a love of all the crazy 50s sci-fi conventions and so how, how big is this game uh well it'll be about as big as say keen four through six or something like that uh just you know a good, a good amount of levels, a good amount of exploration, and you know, uh, once we're uh, rocking on it and uh, finish it, who knows, you know, how much it'll expand because the nature of making it inside this Worlds of Wander tool is we have to make the stuff that's in most of the game, platform games that we know. So you have Mario's wall slide and 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 wall jumping and stuff like that. And, and I'll just, you know, you can record a, de a demo is always recorded when you're playing a level. So you could mess with the time like braid, that kind of thing. So we're, we're trying to stick in every reasonable feature we can from all the platform games we love so that people are able to, to make things that build upon those. So that necessarily infuses this new spiritual successor to Keen with a lot more tools in its toolbox rather than, you know, you'll have something blaster-like and uh, some 
difficult way to jump around the level. But uh, <laughs> it will be Pogo-like, but not pogo -ish. Um But yeah, you'll have a lot of tools from all these other game toolboxes to sort of bring into the mix. So, Tom, let's just say, worst case scenario, this Kickstarter doesn't get funded. Uh, will we still get to see the uh, Worlds of Wonder at some point, or will it be taken no. down forever? Chris and I believe in the this concept of really enabling people, and I think we have a really good sort of design for that. So uh, we're going to keep going with it in our spare time and and get this thing done because it's it's going to be enabling to a lot of people and uh perhaps you know people are just saying well this is a little platform game why does it cost so much money it's like they don't realize there's servers that have to host everybody's content and you know a, a community manager and and all kinds of things that that come when you say i want a central place for everybody to share their stuff but uh, we, we believe in that and, and want to make that happen however we can. So it, it may be uh, within a year, maybe you know, a little bit longer if we don't get funded, but uh, either way, we want to make that thing happen. What do you think people need to know about this project that, you know, let's say they're holding on to 30, 50 bucks, whatever, and they're, you know, they're looking at it, they're thinking, okay, maybe, uh, maybe not, you know, sort of going back and forth. Uh, well, what do they need to know to convince them, okay, I need to go ahead and pledge to this thing? Well, uh, once funded, we're going to get the editor and uh, whatever state the game it is in, in your hands as fast as possible. We're going to develop different graphic packs, so it doesn't have to look like it does in the video. That's just sort of for the demo. It could look painterly, like uh, we included like a screenshot of like super space hero and asteroids and stuff like that. Uh, uh, it can look like a little eight-bit uh, chiptune game. It can look like an old West thing. And the cool thing about it is. If you are making this crazy Wild West game or something like that, you go, no, you know, I kind of really rather go back to sci-fi. You can just change the world theme and all your levels are suddenly sci-fi levels. It, because all the contents in all the different graphics packs exactly the same. So there is a Wild West rope and there's, you know, a sci-fi version of rope uh, and and ladders and stuff like that. Ladder Old West is like rickety old wooden ladder and sci-fi is, you know, fancy space ladder and stuff like that. But it's all those elements are in every single graphics pack. Uh, so whenever you decide, I just want to change my mind, it's that easy to change the entire world. I mean, this just sounds completely amazing to me. You know, I teach some video game courses and I just keep thinking to myself again and again how cool it would be to have this uh, tool that's used in the class, but I mean, why aren't more people talking about this? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I mean, uh, we we've gotten a lot of exposure, and uh, and I, perhaps people don't understand you can change the art style, so they think they're locked into this one, you know, fifties cartoon art style or something like that. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, either we'll uh, peek at the end and and. Uh, show them what this thing can do, or we'll work the, on this in our spare time and show them what this thing can do, because we really believe in it. It's going to be a really empowering tool, and I, and I really want to get it in, like you say, in front of some educators to let them know that this could really uh, be useful in kind of STEM education and even STEAM education, you know, because there's you, know, you could do your own art. Uh, so... I think that would be a really good tool. I mean, there's a lot of brilliant things like that, like GameStar Mechanic and stuff that teachers are using now. But I think this could be such an e like you could lower the bar to when students get exposed to this because they could be empowered much earlier. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about the, the Kickstarter before we move on? It's awesome. Support us and we'll make a cool thing for ye. And I'm wearing a t-shirt of the dude because the dude abides. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, if you like Tom and want to support his uh, project, you really need to go right now 
Uh, as of this uh, moment, right as we speak, uh, there's five days left to go. So hopefully there'll be enough time for you. Uh, just go to the Kickstarter page. There'll be a link in the show notes. And please pledge to this. Even if you don't think uh, it's going to be successfully funded, I, I still think Tom would appreciate your support. Uh, just seeing those numbers of backers go up, uh, seeing that... Uh, figure go up a little bit get him a little bit closer to the goal i'm pretty sure he would uh, that that guy could make a big difference to him so please uh, go do that um as always uh, i want to thank you if you have supported this show it also means a lot to me guys remember you can support matt chat with as little as a dollar a month uh, just go to armchair arcade look for the matt chat link in the top right corner of the page you can uh, set up a subscription whatever amount you like or you can make a one-time donation either way really appreciate it I also want to pass along some good news. Uh, the Asylum Kickstarter from Augustin Cordes, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch Matt Chat 185. That project has successfully funded, and they're now looking at stretch goals. So uh, congratulations to Augustine and the team of, at Sinscape. I'm really looking forward to playing that game, as I know a lot of you guys are. Whew. Okay, Kickstarter, Kickstarters. <laughs> what about that Ale of the Week? Maybe I should start a Kickstarter for that. Uh, this time I've got a little number called the Heart of Darkness. I assume that's a Joseph Conrad reference there. This is a stout from the Magic Hat Brewing Company. Let's see if they say anything about this. A performance in every bottle. Oh, there we go, along the side. You know, I wish there was like a label for beers like those, uh, the ingredients list and vitamins, so you could just <laughs> instantly see this kind of information. Uh, this has 5.7% alcohol, so not bad. Maybe a little bit more than, say, a, say a Budweiser. Uh, this is from South Burlington, Vermont. Uh, the ancient ritual of brewing a distantly Distinctly rich and flavorful beer is a performance to behold. <laughs> kind of twisty little font here. It's hard to read. Our mysterious melange of time-honored ingredients, uh, chaotic chemistry, humble patience, blind faith, blah, blah, blah. Uh, diabolically delicious stout. Definitely has a diabolical label on that. I kind of like this, this eyeball here. You know, I could see getting drunk enough, and that might communicate with me somehow. <laughs> Anyway, let, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I'm here with the Heart of Darkness and the old rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this. It's a... You know what this smells like to me is uh, chocolate milk with a little bit of cherry extract inside. Uh, yeah, it doesn't smell bad. Well, it smells quite nice. I don't detect any uh, fumes of alcohol or anything. Uh, anyway, let's give it a, let's give it a taste. Uh, this one's kind of a little bit bitter on the, in the with the aftertaste. Kind of a uh, cocoa-like almond sort of uh, taste there. Uh, a little bit, a little bitter. Uh, not as thick as I would have imagined uh, a stout uh, should be. This is about the consistency of a Dr. Pepper or something like that. Anyway, it's not bad. Uh, there's kind of a little nuttiness flavor there. I'm going to say this is kind of a middle-of-the-road stout, uh, so I'm going to go uh, two out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely nothing, not bad. I just, uh, you know, there's lots more interesting stouts out there, so I'd probably go for, uh, for something else. But uh, I do like a good marketing campaign, and the design of this bottle, uh, to me, makes it almost worth a shot just for that. Okay, let's wrap this up with a quotation, and I found one from Jeff Bridges, and it goes something like this. I have a word I use for much of my life, plorking. I'm not playing, I'm not working, I am plorking. See you guys next week. I'm stepping away for a moment, boys. Change the scheme, alter the mood. Electrify the boys and girls if you'd be so kind.